you know, Mike, thanks so much for doing this. I and mean, the, the point of this is that there is the, the impact of U.S. elections are critical throughout the entire world. And the whole world follows, you know, our elections and our politics. But because people don't live there, they don't they don't understand it quite the way that that Americans do. And so really what I was trying to do is demystify it a bit um, and ask some questions that I think people out here would ask if they had the opportunity to talk uh, to people like you. So, my, you know, my first question, you know, when you were White House press secretary from 1994 to 1998, what was your job? Well, the, the critical importance of that job is to get information to the public that the public has a right to know and the government has a responsibility to tell. And so my, you know, my routine every day was to work really, really hard at trying to figure out, you know, what, what was the critical information that would be coming up in the daily briefing every day and uh, how could we respond and how could we responsibly get information to the American public. And it, you know, I, I consider that a very critical function and, and I'll, I'll take a second on that uh, point. You know, but the process of preparing for that daily briefing every day meant that you had to get good information. And so sometimes I'd go to President Bill Clinton and sort of say, okay, here's what, you know, here are the questions we're gonna have today, here's the proposed answers. And he'd sometimes look at it and say, well, that's just like, that's BS. <laughs> and I'd say, yeah, that's your policy. <laughs> and so he'd get on the phone and call a cabinet secretary or call someone else in the government and say, look, you know, Mike's got to answer this question today. We, we got to get a better answer for him. So it had the function of actually improving the efficiency of government and making government work better. And uh, I, I, I think that is like one of the most critical aspects of doing those daily briefings. And it's a huge lament to me that uh, the current administration just doesn't do that anymore. And, you know, one of the things you did was open up those daily briefings to, to cameras. And do you yeah. think in hindsight, did, did that help the process, hurt the process? And where do you think that leads us today? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I, I sort of regret the fact that I made it into a live televised briefing. Now, for most of the first three years that I was at the White House, you know, it was not, you know, a, a daily theatrical production. <laughs> reality TV. Uh, but then when the Monica Lewinsky episode happened, it, that's what it became. And my regret is that I didn't put in a, a rule that sort of said, this is all available for broadcast, but it's embargoed until the very end of the briefing. And then you have to make a decision as journalists, what was newsworthy, what wasn't newsworthy. Uh, it didn't necessarily have to be live. But uh, that, that's what it became. It became kind of a live TV spectacle. And that's not what a briefing is. A briefing is a, you know, just one source of information that reporters can have. And then they need to go check it with other sources and you know, prepare reports that actually present you know, a more composite view of what really is happening in our government. And so I made a mistake there. And uh, I, I have been a, several mea culpas on that. <laughs> But uh, I wish I had, you know, sort of put some ground rules in place that would have changed the nature of that so that it was not just a live TV production every day. And is there any way now to put the genie back in the bottle or is, is this what we're going to have forever? It's very, very hard to kind of imagine that we go back to a place where, you know, the, the briefings are not live. But, you know, right now, the, the press secretary at the White House, and I'm not even sure that they, need to have that title anymore because there's no one who serves that role other than the president himself because he's the one that does the daily briefings. Um, I, you know, I, I, I wish there was some way to kind of dial it back a little bit and make this more of what it is. It's a briefing. It's not a television show. Uh, it's, you know, it's one source of information that good reporters can check with other sources and other uh, people who have got commentary on the news, and then you put together a report that actually is more informative for the American people. But I, w whether we could ever get back to that, I, I, I do not know. I know that uh, 
you know, Joe Biden has committed, as all the Democratic candidates did, to kind of return to a time in which there would be regular uh, press briefings at the White House, if not by the president, by the president's designated spokesman, uh, the press secretary, presumably. Uh, and I think that's a good thing. But, but on the other hand, we're a long ways away from that in the age of Trump. And if you were to be, you know, if Joe Biden were to win and his press secretary designee were to come to you uh, for advice, you know, based on your experiences and, and how you see the world today, what, <clears throat> what advice would you give that person? Well, I would, I'd, I'd sort of say the discipline of doing a daily uh, press briefing and being accountable and going in front of the media at the White House and answering legitimate questions that they have about, you know, why is the White House doing this? Why is it doing that? You know, what is the government policy on this, on that? Uh, it, 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 it perfects the performance of government because you have to, you have to come up with better answers. And, uh, that, you know, that, that is one of the utilities of these uh, daily press briefings. And I, I hope that the next president, if it's Joe Biden, restores that. Um, I, I don't think it would happen under the current president, but uh, it, it is something that, you know, I think that we, we ought to kind of hold up and the American people ought to hold accountable uh, those who are in a responsible position and need to be able to uh, respond to questions that are legitimate, that are asked by the media that are there at the White House every day. I have a few different questions I want to ask, but before we leave your time at the White House, everybody always asks me the same thing, so I'm going to ask you. What was Bill Clinton really like to work for as president? Well, he, he's great. He has, a, he has a temperamental mood sometimes. So there would be times in which he would be angry and he'd shake his fist at me and say, you and your friends in the press are trying to destroy America. And I'd say, well, you know, sir, they're not my, they're not my friends. They're just like, I have to work with them every day. Uh, but on the other hand, he had some obligation and some commitment to providing public information. And uh, he recognized the importance of that. He certainly supported me in doing, you know, my role as the White House press secretary, giving a daily briefing to the members of the media at the White House. And uh, he took great care in making sure that I knew what was on his mind. And I would always go to him and sort of say, look, here, here's what we're saying today. Is this what you want us to say? And he would say, no, I want you to, he would kind of dial it one way or another. And so I've got to reflect what his thinking was, because it's not, you know, the press, nobody cares what the press secretary thinks. It's really what the president thinks that people want to hear about. And uh, it was a very, very good working relationship. And he's, he's, you know, amazingly intellectually curious and know so many things about stuff. We would sometimes go in and do a briefing with him and he would say, well, you know, I, I read an article about that. And, you know, and you know, we'd look around and say, that wasn't in the briefing book. And so he had, you know, this, he had kind of, he would, uh, he was a scrounge for information and he would talk to a lot of people and read a lot of things. Um, and that kind of intellectual curiosity is something that I think is very, very important in the presidency. And frankly, we don't have that now. And, you know, moving, you know, to when I first met you, which was at the Democratic Convention in Atlanta in 1988, when I was 22 years old uh, and uh, a little you were one of our You were one of our warriors on the front line to <laughs> hear the press. As a, uh, a volunteer right out of the University of Virginia. And, um, but, you know, one of the things I was going to ask is, you know, I have such fond memories of the, of the conventions I went to. Do you even think there is going to be a convention? Can there be a convention, you know, this year for the Democrats in Milwaukee or the Republicans in North Carolina? Well, it's going to be a, an interesting question. You know, they've obviously pushed back the date of the Democratic National Convention. So it's later in the year. It's going to be in August. Um, and we'll see where we are at that point. I mean, it may be impossible for a large gathering of people to congregate at that time. I mean, one of the great things about this convention is it's like you you wander around and you meet people and you talk to folks that you haven't seen for a long time. It's, it's kind of like a college reunion in many ways because people who haven't seen each other for a long time get together and have a good time. Um, under the current circumstances right now, hard to imagine that that would happen. But 
where we are in August might be a very, very different equation. Uh, the conventions are important. They, you know, they, they sometimes get pilloried in the national press because they're just kind of like everyone says, oh, that's just a, a big TV show. But they set an agenda and they define something that, you know, you want to put forward in front of the American people for the national campaign that's going to come up. And so I think they, they play a very, very important role in that sense. And, and the other thing is it's a gathering of a national political party. And our party system is important in our democracy. Uh, we've got two major political parties. We do have other political parties as well. But uh, the way in which they define and set their agenda and articulate that agenda it really uh, then defines what, what will happen. Uh, depending on who gets elected president. And so they play a very, very important function. And as much as some people like to kind of sort of say, oh, these conventions are boring or they're just television shows or, you know, they're useless at this point, I, I tend to discount that because I think there is an important role that they play. And they also ha happen to allow people to organize for the fall general election campaign. So you get delegations together and they begin to meet with each other and they figure out what their strategies are going to be for the coming national campaign. And I think that's a very important function that they play as well. So do you think that that means that if these become virtual this year, that it really hurts the Democrats because there's a lot more organizing that needs to get done than for the incumbent in addition to the healing that needs to take place? Um, I yeah, I, I think we lose something if there's not a convention that is in person in Milwaukee uh, as we go into the summer, because people get together, they plan, they make uh, general election strategies, they put, uh, put you know, campaigns together, they figure out who's going to run which state, you know, th th there is a organizing function that happens at these conventions. And if you don't do it in person, because you have to do it virtually, I think we will lose something, but it, you know, it's, it's, it's way too early right now to predict what kind of environment we're going to be in in August. But, uh, you know, you can see that this plays out and maybe makes it impossible to have those kinds of traditional conventions. Yeah. And, you know, one of the other experiences you had, in addition to being press secretary, in addition to being the, the, the spokesperson for the party, was to be the co-chair of the National Commission on, on Presidential Debates. What was that experience like? How many years did you do it? What what did you learn from that? I, well, I went through three cycles. Uh, first, as an understudy to Paul Kirk, the former chairman of the Democratic Party, who, along with Frank Farenkopf, the chairman of the Republican Party, set up this commission. They set it up because they said we should not have debate debates about debates. Uh, we should make regular the the opportunity for Americans to see the major candidates for president face each other, debate the issues, uh, talk about the future of the country. And that was a, a great gift that they gave to our democracy, I think. I think these debates are important. People watch them. They get, you know, very, very high ratings. At high ratings, something that Donald Trump apparently is very interested in. Um, but, you know, they, they also sort of set a framework for then what happens after the election. Uh, what is the agenda? What what are what did people talk about? What did they uh, put forward as what their you know priorities would be if they were elected president? And I think that is a very very important function in our democracy. And it, you know I was very proud to be a part of that uh, for the time I was there. Um, I think there's always improvements that you can make in these debate formats, and you know we experimented with a lot of different kinds of debates, getting more people involved, getting it, you know, uh, making it a little more uh, easy for people to put in questions and things like that. So we've, we've worked hard on the format of these debates, but I think people expect them. Now. I mean, the good thing is there was a time in our presidential election process where it was no guarantee that there would be presidential debates. And now it's pretty much a guarantee because people know that they, they expect it to happen. And if it doesn't happen, they would sort of say, well, what, you know, what what is that about? You know why 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 aren't we having debates? So, I, I think we will have debates. Um, you know that Trump has kind of hinted that he might decide that he really doesn't want to do them. 
But uh, we'll see. I think it'd be very, very tough even for President Trump to back out of doing these debates when we get to the fall uh, of this election year. And, and what would they be like if it weren't the traditional debates, you know, on the college campus with the live audience and instead, you know, being more like what we saw with, with Sanders and Biden six feet apart in a, in a TV studio? Who, who, to whose advantage would that play? Trump's, Biden's? Well, I say, I mean, it's hard to predict that, but, you know, the, the very first presidential televised debate between Kennedy and Nixon in 1960 was exactly that. It was, you know, two guys sitting in a studio back and forth with each other with no audience. Sandy Van Oker was the uh, very capable moderator of that, those debates. So we might see something like that where, but, you know, it, it's, it's, it's really who articulates a vision and who seems to have some kind of credible plan about the future of the country. And, and that's what the debates are at the end. The most important thing is who, who has the compelling argument about the future of the country. And as we roll you know, into the, the general election campaign, I mean, I know you're not formally involved with the Biden campaign, but you know, how do you see the, the election setting up? Is it gonna be solely a referendum on Trump and how he does with the coronavirus? Or is it gonna be a more of a choice between Biden and Trump? And what does the Biden campaign do under both of those scenarios? Well, it's a tough question because we really don't know where we will be as we think ahead to the fall. I mean, it's a long time to November and there's so many different things that could happen, so many different uh, possibilities. But at the end of the day, you know, I, I'd say, a, a successful campaign for president is based on several things. One is a, a very clear articulation of what the what your vision is for the future of the country. You know, people don't want to know what you've done in the past. Too many candidates always talk about, well, here's my experience and here's the record I have and here's what I've done. You know, people frankly don't care about the past. They want to know what's in it for them in the future. So articulating some strong vision of the future. I think the second thing is to really demonstrate that you've got the capacity to do the job, you know, that you could actually be a good president, that you know what the mechanics are, that you uh, uh, are capable of being, you know, that kind of, of candidate. And then the, the third is really the character of the person involved. You know, is this someone I trust? Is this someone I believe in? Is this someone that I feel good about? Uh, the personality aspects of that. And I think all of those three things have to come together for a successful candidacy. Now I'd say, you know, your, your next question would be, well, how's Biden doing so far on those things? Um, and, you know, and Trump, you know, Trump is Trump. So there's, you know, we kind of know what the deal is there. But I think, uh, you know, Vice President Biden will have to to articulate some really compelling view of what the country would be like if he served for president as four or eight years. And, uh, and that, that remains to be seen at this point. I mean, I think he's, he's put together a very strong campaign and a strong candidacy, but you know, people have got to be able to say, you know, here's what Joe Biden is all about. And it has to kind of boil down to not just a bumper strip, but something that people sort of say, yeah, that strikes me as being, he's got it about right. And uh, we haven't heard that yet. So that, that'll be his challenge, I think, as we go through the next several months. And I, you know, George H.W. George Bush, I said, you know, called it that vision thing, right? It's, uh, it's, it is definitely the vision thing. And it is, it is the quintessential part of our quadrennial uh, presidential campaign every four years. Americans come together and they want to think about what the future of the country is going to look like. And they want someone who's really articulating some sense of, you know, well, where will, where will we be four years from now or eight years from now? And uh, the candidates who are successful are the ones who really put that together and make people believe that there is a future. I mean, I'll, I'll give you a, a great little example. In 2016, we had one candidate who said, I want to make America great again. All right, well, that, that, that's a vision, you know. What does that mean? What does it mean to make America great again? I mean, I would challenge anybody to sort of remember what Hillary Clinton's slogan was. It was, by the way, stronger together. And that begged the question, stronger together 
for what purpose? You know, for why? What are we going to do? And I think the, the lack of that kind of a, a visionary element is something that is sort of fatal to candidates that don't know how to articulate that. And, and can some candidates just, do they just, is that just not who they are? As you know, you mentioned, I don't remember John McCain being able to articulate that. I certainly remember Obama, you know, being able to oh. articulate that. Oh, and, and, and right. Bill Clinton too, you know, building the bridge to the 21st century. And, and so is it just some people have it and some people don't, or can you learn it even if you don't have it? Yeah, I think, I think it's, you know, some candidates instinctively know how to talk about the future in a way that's compelling. And some just really want to rely on, they, they believe that their, their credentials and their record is so strong that it ought to be a compelling argument for their election. And that's not the basis on which most Americans will really make a decision. They will, they will think about those issues once you've compelled them to believe that there's something better in their future ahead. So you have to talk about the future, you have to have lay out some kind of real strong vision, and then they will then look at your record and say, okay, I, I believe this person has the capacity to get those things done. And uh, that, that, that's the way great uh, presidential candidates, uh, you know, move ahead in the process. That's the way they win. And I know just to, to, to you know, conclude that you're now spending all of your time teaching and, and you, you're a professor now. And just maybe talk a little bit about what you're doing and why you're doing it and how you're doing it. Well, I teach in an area that we call public theology. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it's the place where faith and politics come together in the public square. I teach at a Methodist seminary here in Washington, D.C., Part of that is kind of my own journey away from politics and more deeply into my own personal faith as a Methodist. Uh, but it really, you know, as I look at the things that actually can bring people together and have people, uh, you know, engage in more creative and respectful dialogue, I see churches as a place where a lot of that can happen. So what I've tried to do is equip churches and equip clergy people and the people that we train at the seminary to be more facile when it comes to talking about political issues. That's not something that normally, you know, many pastors or ministers or priests or rabbis want to talk about because it's, you know, it's, it, it runs the risk of offending some of the people. But if you can find the right way to create those kinds of dialogues in the public square that we might end up in a better place. I mean, there aren't that many places where you can go to have kind of good, calm, reasoned discussions about politics because you certainly can't do it on cable television. Uh, but, you know, if you've, you've got a place where you can actually respectfully hear someone who you disagree with politically then and then talk about what your differences are and talk about places where you might actually find some agreement, uh, I think that's a very, very useful place for the church and for the faith community to be engaged. And have you seen the fruits of your labor yet on, on these efforts? Uh, yeah, here and there, yes. I mean, it's, it, it's, uh, it, it's not easy work. Uh, I mean, it's, it, it's hard. And uh, a lot of people sort of freeze up when they, you know, they say, I don't want to go to church to hear about politics, which, you know, that's a perfectly reasonable position, although every church I've ever been to, people are talking about politics in the parking lot after the church is over. <laughs> so, so, you know, if you can bring it inside and make it a more informed conversation and provide some, you know, dimensions of faith that actually inform the public issues, I think that's a very, very valuable thing uh, for clergy and for churches to be doing. So that's the work that I do now. I kind of am engaged in how do you you know, train young seminarians to do a better job of that as they go out to serve the local church. Well, I would just say that is, uh, you know, just watching what happens on social media and Twitter and, 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 and cable channels that, you know, we get a few of those out here in, in Singapore, you know, we get CNN and, and Fox. I mean, the work you're doing is, has never been needed more than it is now. So thanks for taking the time to talk. Thanks so much for doing this.
Well, it's great to see you and uh, think about you in Singapore. I wish I, we had done this at, what's the name of that uh, big restaurant, Raffles, that's got the Singapore sling. That's where we went when you were here. That's right. Would have been fun to do it over that, but uh, I look forward to doing that again someday. As soon as the travel restrictions are lifted. <laughs> yes, exactly. All right. Thanks so much, Mike. Thanks, Steve. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.